I once uh, was had the the dubious pleasure of meeting uh, the model Irina Shuk, uh, who has dated some of the wealthiest oligarchs in the world, mm. and. Um, and she, uh, she said, you know, we were talking about, I met her in Manhattan in New York. She said, oh, where do you live? I said, oh, I live in Brooklyn. She went, Brooklyn, too far. <laughs> and uh, I said, oh, I said, so, so where do you live? And she said it as if it was one phrase, as if it was the name of the whole place. She said, West Village, best place. And I thought, well, okay, you just have a very particular view of the world, you know, <laughs> owing, owing largely to your bank balance. And, uh, you know, that kind of snobbery that comes with, uh, with that kind of wealth. I, I just wanted yeah. to infuse Alexander with a bit of that, whilst also making him, you know, a little, a little more likable, perhaps. Did you rub my land? Hey, how's it going, everyone? And welcome to Film Speak, where the conversation continues after the credits. And if this is our first time meeting, hey, my name is Griffin Schiller. I'm an L.A. based entertainment journalist and film critic. And if you want to be a part of that conversation, consider subscribing to the channel for more insight, analysis and interviews behind your favorite movies. And today I'm so thrilled to be able to bring you another fantastic interview. Seriously, I've been getting some great interviews here. I, I don't know if you all have enjoyed them as much as I've enjoyed conducting them, but they've they've been great. And this is just another fantastic conversation I'm happy to bring to you all. Of course, I'm talking about my conversation with Dan Stevens. Many of you are probably already familiar with Stevens' work, given that he was on one of the BBC's most acclaimed costume dramas of all time in Downton Abbey. But, you know, when he left that show at the peak of its popularity back in 2012, his future wasn't so certain, eh, but you know he decided to pack his bags, move to America, and pursue a career in cinema. And it's something I have to commend him for because it led to interesting roles in genre films such as The Guest, Colossal. Obviously, he hit it big with the live-action remake of Beauty and the Beast, but then he went and he did some really interesting high concept sci-fi material with Noah Hawley in FX's Legion where they not only challenged cable television but they challenged the comic book genre as a whole and seriously if you have not watched Legion yet you should because it's one mind fuck of a series and I can't believe something like that honestly exists. But currently, Dan can be found in Netflix's Eurovision movie, which stars Will Ferrell and Rachel McAdams. But to me, it's Dan Stevens that steals the whole show. I mean, he is just, he lights up the screen with his suave and eccentric portrayal as this Russian oligarch, Alexander Lemtov. And uh, we get into that a little bit in this conversation, how he formulated that character, how an interaction with a famous Russian model kind of planted the seeds for where he would take that character. But later this summer, he can also be found in Dave Franco's directorial debut, The Rental, which is a nice little thriller and I think the biggest takeaway is is that audiences are not going to want to stay at an Airbnb after seeing that movie but again Dan gives another great performance in that film as well but over the course of this conversation we talk about dialect because it's something that he's fascinated with his love of literature and how it led to the creation of this online publication called The Junket and I'm sure many of you aren't aware but Dan is actually an accomplished audiobook narrator in his own right and so we touch on that as well and of course with him lending his voice to one of my favorite novels of of all time, Ian Fleming's Casino Royale, we touch on James Bond and how he went about adapting a character that's so ingrained in pop culture on screen for listeners. Obviously, we touch on Legion, his ambitions of becoming a writer and director one day, and so much more. Seriously, this one was a blast, guys. I had a real fun time chatting with Dan, and I hope that all comes through. But the biggest takeaway for me was that he's someone who just loves creativity and has a really incredible imagination and I hope that's a takeaway for you all as well but before we get into this thing let me know down in the comments section what your favorite Dan Stevens performance is I want to hear all about it all right enough chit chat let's get into this thing here is my conversation with Dan Stevens I've been, I've been working on my own buying unnecessary microphones and things like that um, <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I was actually, I was actually going to ask you how the how the um the whole Zoom interviews has sort of like affected like you in general. Is like, are you like really into getting more like I, I guess I guess you would call it like live streaming equipment or whatever. Yeah, I, it, it's definitely become a you know a much bigger part of my of my life, and um, I just sort of threw up this black backdrop in my garage so that I'm hiding yeah. all of my paint cans and everything behind me. But um, <laughs> yeah, no, it's uh, it's it's tricky just to find a place in my house that's quiet enough uh, with three kids to, to yeah hold, yeah. Hold an I, was, I was actually about to I ask you. I was like, how do you how do you even find like a space? You know, I mean, I guess exactly. the garage is the 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 only option really. I thought about digging a bunker or something, but uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nice, thing. nice, very, very nice. Good. Awesome. Well, uh, I guess we, we could just sort of get into this thing, starting with uh, Eurovision, because yeah. I, I do want to touch on Eurovision. I want to touch on the rental, and I kind of want to touch on your career in general. But we'll start You're with awesome. Eurovision, because that's the, the first thing coming out. Um, yeah. Really, it, it, it was such an interesting experience watching this film, because I like literally knew nothing about Eurovision in general. And I feel oh, like amazing. by watching it, I learned so much about you, you know, the culture, uh, what it's all about and, and, and whatnot. And so I'm curious for you, I mean, obviously, you know, be, being from the UK and whatnot, I, I assume Eurovision was a big, or I don't know if it was particularly big for you, but just kind of like out there in the ether and whatnot. So yeah. I guess what has your experience sort of been with the Eurovision competition? And then what did this film sort of teach you that you didn't know before? Yeah, I mean, well, for pretty much everybody growing up in Europe, you know, the Eurovision Song Contest has existed since our parents were kids. It's something that's just on every year. And whether you like it or not, it's it's a big, big thing. It's I think it's now one of the most watched TV events on the planet. Mm. And uh, I definitely watched it growing up with my mom and dad. It's always uh, a really confusing night uh, because, <laughs> you know, there's just a lot of countries submitting a lot of different kinds of music. It's a very long night. Um, you have everybody perform, then you have all the countries voting, which gets quite intense and political. Um, mm. If you're from the UK, you're very used to people just saying uh, nil point or n zero points. Uh, we are historically bad uh, at, at Eurovision. Um, although we've had a, a couple of notable exceptions, but generally it's a, it's a night where as a nation we come together in shame and uh, realize how, how either how bad we are at singing or how much people uh, dislike us. Um, and, uh, so there's, there's that for the, for the UK, but, um, yeah, it's really funny to me that, you know, Americans, adult Americans are now, uh, you know, realizing what this thing is. And, uh, you know, our film, I think only scratches the surface of how, how bizarre it is. Yeah. Right. Well, I guess the big thing for me is that it was just, you know, you have the, that, that great musical number in the middle, whereas like, you know, to some people, it might seem like a fever dream or something like that that sort of just like randomly appears. But to me, it was yeah. like it was just such a great encapsulation of the culture, the acceptance, uh, you know, the celebration of diversity uh, and, you, you know, LGBTQ plus is very LGBTQ plus positive and whatnot. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I, I feel like that was, you know, again, not knowing a whole lot about the competition, just what the film basically taught me, what research taught me, I feel like that that number in particular was really important in sort of like hammering home, you know, this is Eurovision, you know? Yeah, it's, it's such a bizarre idea, you know, the idea of bringing Europe together, but it has been for a long, long time, uh, a safe haven and a real champion of LGBTQ performers and also has a huge fan base in mm -hmm. Europe and all over the world. And I think, you know, it has a bit of a cult following in the US as a result. But mm -hmm. uh yeah, it's uh, it's it's a really special thing, you know, for that reason. And you know, they've had, I think, you know, a few years back, uh, Dana Israel was the first trans uh, singer to win. You know, uh, Conchita Wurst, you know, a drag artist, you know, won in a in beautiful pearl dress and a beard. And mm. uh, you know, they've had they've had many many uh, contestants uh, performing and winning, uh, who might not necessarily get that opportunity in their own country because of the various, you know, governments and restrictions and, and whatever. And uh, so it's, yeah, it's an amazing thing for that reason. Well, and that's sort of where your character comes in because I, I absolutely loved your character. And what I loved about him was, you know, he's, he's larger than life and uh, he, you could very easily play him one way, but your, your perception of him sort of changes. Cause you know, you're, you're a little bit hesitant to trust him at first, you know, like, okay, this guy might be a little sleazy or whatever. Um, but then, you know, he, he just like, no, he's just really charming and supportive. And then, you know, we keep waiting for this like villainous turn 
and it never happens. It's it just it subverts your your expectations in in the best way possible. Uh, and so I'm curious for you, like what what was kind of like your reaction to reading a character like that who could have very easily gone in just a one note direction? Yeah, I mean, it, there's many different ways you can you can sort of approach that character, and it's obviously uh, you know it's an interesting time to be playing a Russian, um, you know. But uh, I think sort of decade to decade, it goes around who who it's acceptable. Uh, which nationality it's acceptable to have play the villain. Um, mm-hmm. You know, for a while in the 80s, it was the French. And then, you know, it's long been the British. Um, and I guess it's the Russians' turn for the moment. Um, but, uh, you know, he was informed by a number of different things, really. And I guess, yeah, you you want him initially to have the sense, oh, maybe this is the villain coming in, trying to break up Fire Saga, drag yeah, yeah. Sigrid away. But he's obviously got kind of... His own motivations for for wanting her um, along alongside, um, but also you know a huge amount of fun to be had with just the you know the mysterious, yeah. the mysteriously wealthy Russian you know and yeah. and the kind of yeah. the attitudes of just an absurdly wealthy European character like that. Um, I once uh, was had the the dubious pleasure of meeting uh, the model Irina Shuk. Uh, who has dated some of the wealthiest oligarchs in the world. Mm. And, um, and she, uh, she said, you know, we were talking about, I met her in Manhattan, in New York. She said, oh, where do you live? I said, oh, I live in Brooklyn. She went, Brooklyn, too far. <laughs> and uh, I said, oh, I said, so, so where do you live? And she said it as if it was one phrase, as if it was the name of the whole place. She said, West Village, best place. And I thought, well, okay. You just have a very particular view of the world, you know, <laughs> owing, owing largely to your bank balance. And, uh, you know, that kind of snobbery that comes with, uh, with that kind of wealth. I, I just wanted yeah. to infuse Alexander with a bit of that, whilst also making him, you know, a little, a little more likable, perhaps. <laughs> yeah. No, well, I, I definitely got that for sure. That's, that's fascinating. You know, because I, 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 I guess during, like, some of my research, I, I kind of... Uh, discovered that you you're drawn to dialect and that's sort of like an entry point for you into characters i i believe right yeah it, can, it certainly can be you know i wanted to i wanted to get i wanted to find a voice that i was comfortable uh you know speaking speaking in and also improvising and you know working with will ferrell you've got to be very on your toes you've got to you know i can't i can't sort of think okay I, I need to go and sit with my dialect coach and come up with this improvised line i need to be able to just come out with stuff as he does and so um yeah, finding finding the voice for him was a lot of fun. Yeah, well, I, and I guess you know because you're working with a dialect coach, and then also you're you're kind of doing some research on your own. How like how much did you were you able to kind of just pick up naturally on your own versus like what you had to do with a with a coach? I actually didn't use a coach for this one. I, I sometimes do, and then uh, with this one, I, I sort of felt confident enough. I, I, I have some Russian friends who were you know mm-hmm. kind enough to lend me their time and and talk me through some some things and just. I was also just looking for, you know, I guess this being a comedy, you don't want to just completely send up an accent. That's not, I don't know, ultimately that's not very funny to me, but just finding a few choice words that, you know, to an English or uh, an English speaking ear, um, you know, just are are a little bit different. And so it's just finding those, those, you know, those vowels or those, those, uh, those syllables or whatever, whatever it is that kind of key into to who Lemtov is and, and how he speaks. Mm, yeah, that's oh, that, that's that's really interesting because it, it, I felt like it was like rooted in the real world. Like you know, it's it, it could have been a cartoon or, or whatever, but it, it felt super authentic in terms of the accent. So it was like yeah. I, I don't know, you hit that sweet spot that was just like really impressive. And well, it was you know, it was tricky because you have you know Rachel and Will doing their Icelandic, uh, yeah, and then you yeah. have uh, Melissa doing a Greek accent and me doing Russian. And then if we had a group scene together, we very often our accents would just kind of meld into this generic European. Sort yeah, of style, right. <laughs> which is very Eurovision, you know, Eurovision. Right. Right, right. It's all, uh, all about that. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what I didn't even think of that because everyone's doing an accent and I'm sure it kind of like throws you off and then you start adopting different words from the other person in the scene. And so yeah, I, I bet everyone's yeah. just it's like very, breaking it, I have one of those ears where if I'm talking to somebody from wherever it is for 15 minutes, I will start talking like them, whether I want to or not. I might, I, it starts <laughs> coming out. If I'm talking to a Scottish person, it's yeah. terrible. I, you know, and I have to start apologizing. It's like, I'm so sorry. It's almost like a, it's like a sort of accent Tourette's or something. I just yeah. can't help myself. So, yeah. 
Well, that's interesting because I, I, you know, kind of moving away from Eurovision, I know you, you've done a lot of work in, uh, you know, audio books and radio plays uh, and it kind of, you know, tying back to, to your, your fascination with, with dialect and stuff like that. And so was, was like vocal performance ever a consideration for you at, at one point in your career? How, how do you mean? Like, uh, oh, like, like voice acting, like doing either like animated films or, or stuff like that. Yeah, it still is. You know, that's that's long been a, a huge ambition of mine. And, you know, unfortunately, it's a, it's a tricky world to break into. Um, I was lucky enough to, to get a role on uh, this DreamWorks Netflix show last year called Kipo, um, which I've been having fun with. And um, yeah, I've, I've always loved doing it. You know, audiobooks as well. I, you know, I grew up on audiobooks and, and if you're into them, they're hugely important to you. You know, if I, yeah, I get it. Yeah. Some people, that's not how they want to consume a book and, and whatever. But in recent years, it's, you know, it's been a real growth area. And, um, but I, I grew up with them. You fall in love with the voice of a reader and, you know, you're really trusting their imagination and their ability to interpret that world for you. And, and particularly in voices, you know, and I've, I've done some books where I've, I've had to, you know, whether they're any good or not, I don't know, but I've had to come up with like over 70 or a hundred voices to distinguish different characters mm-hmm. or whatever. And, um, you know, doing war horse, uh, the audio book, I think I had to come up with like 20 different German accents. And I, I, <laughs> I'm not sure I have 20 German accents to be honest, but, um, you know, it's, it's just sort of, it's a great responsibility to, to interpret a text for a listener and to be, you know, that intimate, you know, with their ears. And, uh, so yeah, I still, I still love it. I mean, I love, radio is a way of working. Um, I love radio interviews when I get to do them because, you know, obviously a lot of these things are filmed now and that's just the way, the way things are. But, you know, I love the imagination of the viewer and, you know, we could, we could be sitting in a booth just like this, but we could, we could say whatever. And, and, uh, and the, and the listener can imagine we're wherever wearing whatever, or, you know, and oh, it, yeah, sort of, yeah. it, it's just a very playful kind of way of working. And, um, yeah, I love it. So it's, it's definitely something I want to get more into. And as I was saying, I've been, in, in lockdown, investing in all sorts of uh, microphones and audio equipment and um, been playing around. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, starting your own podcast, maybe. Eh? Maybe. maybe. <laughs> I don't know. I, yeah. It's a, that's a big pond now. I'm not sure what I would have to contribute to the podcast world, but uh, yeah, we'll see. Yeah. No. Well, I, I guess that's interesting, though, kind of talking about, uh, you know, how intimate you are with the listeners. Because if, if this is the first time someone's hearing that book, it, your interpretation of the story is, is going to be very impressionable it's going to stick with them uh for you know a long period of time and I, I guess the big question uh you know with any sort of adaptation is like how do you know that you've gotten to the heart of that source material or like that that you've told the original author's truth um and so with the you know audiobooks you're literally reading uh the words of that author author however you kind of have to put your own spin on it and so what I guess, what is that experience like when you compare it to adapting something for like film or television? Well, it, it's kind of similar in a way. I mean, I on a much more micro scale, obviously, and you know, I guess first and foremost, it's the responsibility of of the producer or the publisher to say, well, actually, I think you know Dan's voice really fits this book, you know, this particular style, um, and so you know, there's there's that match up. But then also, very often in, in my head, I will I will cast a, a, a movie, a, a book. Um, mm. So I will cast this in my head. Oh, the father, he's he kind of reminds me of I don't know this actor. So I'll I'll sort of do a, a version of his voice, as much for my own head. So when I get to him, it's like oh, I know he sounds like this guy. And then, you know, obviously female voices, you just you know you're obviously not sort of, I mean for the most part, you're not doing a kind of ridiculous lady voice, you know, that would just right, be stupid. Right, yeah. But it's like, it's just varying your your vocal quality enough so that the listener knows who's speaking and knows what's going on. And sometimes you come across books where that's not always clear. You know, some books that are written in a more modern or modernist style where you have to really work hard and it takes sometimes twice as long as it does to record to actually prep a book and go through and differentiate who's speaking and how they're speaking. And, you know, I have these sort of long cast lists alongside just going, okay, who's talking now? You know, it's, sometimes there'll be like two pages of just full notes of like who's talking when. And it's really fun, yeah, yeah. but it is it's very time consuming. And as a result, I haven't, I haven't done as many in recent years as I would have liked. Yeah. Do you have like a favorite out of the ones you've done or just like a favorite audio book where the, you know, the, the, the narrator really just kind of like hit that sweet spot? Um, that's a good question. Because, you know... I, they, they all have their own challenges, really. I mean, I think I was very proud of of having got to do Wolf Hall by Hilary Mantel because that's just an incredibly difficult read. 
and whether you're reading it for audio or not, it's just you, you can't quite tell who's, spilt, who, who's speaking. And yeah, yeah. Uh, so that was just a, a lot of work. But then a lot of the kids ones I've done, you know, just in terms of the the fun that you get to have with the voices, like, you know, if you get to do the voice of a dragon, you know, you can really go to town. You don't have to have yeah. it sort of so yeah. rooted in reality, I guess. Um, but then, you know, I really enjoyed just just this week, it sort of came came up in my consciousness because uh, a great Spanish author um, called Carlos Ruiz Zafon died. And, you know, he's one of the, he, he's one of the most read Spanish authors since Cervantes. And he's been mm-hmm. translated into many, many languages. And I was lucky enough to be the voice of his work for a, a good three or four of his books, I think. And they're really kind of... I, I don't know, they're sort of dark, gothic, kind of romantic books. They, they're always set in some kind of mysterious library or bookshop, which I just love. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and so I, I kind of really disappeared into those worlds. And so, yeah, I guess you know, looking back on those, I, you know, that, that was a big part of my, uh, my audio life was spent with his work. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Um, I guess one of my personal favorite of the ones you've done and, and, you know, granted it's just because I'm biased over here is Casino Royale being just like a massive oh, yeah, Bond okay. fan. Yeah. Always, you know, always wanting you to have played Bond. I just felt like you'd be <laughs> perfect for that role. Uh, it's a actually a question. Of, <laughs> right. <laughs> well, Hey, I mean, maybe it's in the cards <laughs> for the future. Who knows? Um, but I, I guess something I've always wanted to ask you about that is like when you're reading that and you're getting inside the mind of like a character like that, um, how, how did you, you view uh i guess fleming's words and and what did you know how did you view that experience of, of bringing a character to life through audio that we've seen countless times on screen yeah that's a really good question because i think a lot of people i mean obviously he is widely read but i i would say more people have seen the films than have read the books these days yeah. um yeah. and it was really surprising to me particularly casino royale is an interesting one because he's very vulnerable in that book. Mm. And I think, you know, the interpretation that that we're used to and the sort of stereotype, even though he's been played by a number of different actors now, is of this sort of swaggering, you know, guy who just goes around bedding women and killing spies and, you know, is all very cool. And actually, you know, Casino Royale, you see a a very different side to him. And and so that was really, that was really surprising for me. And I think surprising for, for some of the listeners was to get, to get to grips with the, a more vulnerable side of that character and, and see it, you know, see him in a different light, I suppose, and, and get to portray that, which might not necessarily work on screen. You know, when it's a you know, hundred plus million dollar movie, they're going to say, actually, yeah. you kind of stick to brand a bit. And, you know, there wasn't that pressure in the, in the book. It was like, this is what's on the page. This is what I'm getting. You know, he, is it Vespa Lind, his girlfriend? I'm, I'm my yeah. memory. Yeah. Now, but, um, yeah. you know, it, how he feels, how he mourns for her. You know, it's, uh, it's very surprising. It was, yeah, that was cool. No, I, I, and that's, that's one of the reasons why I think that book in particular is, you, you know, you can adapt it in different ways. And I think it's why the movie is so successful as well. Um, yeah, you're right. You're right. You really get to the heart of like who that character is, and and like see him. Yeah, more and you, you just get to kind of dwell on his thoughts a bit because he's obviously you know yeah. he's a very kind of cool customer, and and film doesn't really get in there in the same way. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's quite interesting to kind of dwell dwell on his inner life a bit more than we do with the movies. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I guess kind of shifting away from you know uh, vocal stuff and 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 voiceover. I I read that you did that you did a little bit of stand up comedy in in college. <laughs> is that true? Did yeah, that was that was mostly what I did. I did a couple of plays, but other than that, it was all stand up and sketch comedy. Yeah. So I guess which which came first was it your work on the stage that led to stand up, or was it kind of stand up that led to your to your work on stage? I mean, I was already into you know doing school plays. I guess when I was at, when I was at high school, and then I knew when I I got to Cambridge University, there was a very famous comedy club there called the Footlights, which has produced a lot of great British comedy talent. And I knew that it was a, it was just a great thing to be a part of, great thing to do. And to have to challenge yourself to write five minutes of stand up every week, you know, every mm-hmm. Tuesday night at 11 o'clock, there's a student run stand up and sketch show. And, you know, the students attend and, you know, it's, it's very varied in, in style and quality, but, you know, it enables probably 20 students every week to get up and do their thing. And, I really love that. You know, that's just the challenge of going about your week and coming up with new material and then making it yeah, work yeah. on stage. And I think, you know, making your own words work for laughs, you know, in front of an audience is probably the best training I had. I didn't do a formal drama school training. You know, I, I've just tried different things and, you know, just sort of beg, steal and borrow from people I've worked with and things I've done and just sort of incorporated different elements. And, um, 
I really loved it. I love watching stand up. I, I hugely admire it as a as an art form, uh, if you can call it that. And uh, mm. I, you know, I had no real ambitions to be one. I don't think, but I just knew that I wanted to try it and I wanted to learn from it. And uh, I've definitely, I've definitely, you know, kept elements that I've that I've learned from that in in the work that I've gone on to do. I think. Yeah. Well, I, I guess the thing is, like, people don't, I, I guess, inherently think of you this way. But it's like you're incredibly you've got like really impressive comedic chops when you know you need to show them and i'm wondering if that kind of like comes back to you know your work on there being quick on your feet uh you know understanding like how to you know elicit a laugh out of an audience or, or whatnot i guess so it's, it's quite a mercurial thing that and it's not something you can necessarily just sort of learn in a book or in a class but it's just sort yeah. of through yeah. practice i guess um and you know i've been lucky enough since since moving to the states particularly to get back into comedy. You know, in, in the UK, after I left college, I, I quite quickly got into doing sort of period dramas and, and things like that that are that tend towards the more earnest side, you know, and um, and so sort of away from the from the comedy. And then since since being here and, you know, I've, I've been lucky enough to work with, you know, Robin Williams and Will Farrell and Ben Stiller. And, you know, I've, I've had a really amazing run of just learning from some some brilliant comedians. And um, yeah, I mean, that's definitely something I'm, I'm, I want to do more of, you know. Yeah, for, well, I mean, would you ever consider, you know, going back on on stage and doing stand up for like a special occasion or whatnot? I don't know. I don't know. I've I have thought about it. I have thought about it. It's not without the realms of possibility. I've thought so, you know, while I'm here with this black backdrop, I should just do it here. You know. Yeah, honestly, yeah. The risk <laughs> of an audience, I could just do it. Yeah, a right. <laughs> That'd be funny. Do like uh, Dan Stevens live stream uh, stand ups. Just like, live stream. Just just yeah, phone yeah. in. The, just do some more, like uh, laughter track, and you know. Yeah. <laughs> it went really well. It went really well. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. There you go. You have it. you have all the encouragement you need right there. Um, but yeah, you know, given given that your your you kind of you know beginnings in there, you know, your work in radio and audiobooks, uh, you studied literature in college, uh, and I guess I, I get the sense that you have like a real love of it. Obviously, um, I, you know, I get the sense you're kind of drawn to words, you know, um, and I guess the innate creat- creativity that. Uh, you know, they inspire. And and I don't mean that just in terms of like scripts, but like the, the freedom of letting your imagination sort of run wild, you know, without cameras, props or, or costumes or, or whatnot, and just kind of getting to the roots of, uh, of storytelling. Is that, you, you find that? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I find writers fascinating and, uh, you know, I've, I've always enjoyed writing myself, although, you know, that, that comes and goes, uh, depending on how busy I am. But, um, but yeah, I, I, I've always been fascinated by by words, by word play, uh, by languages. You know, um, I've always, you know, been. I, I don't. I speak a couple of languages, but not. Uh, I wouldn't call myself a sort of a great linguist. But um, right. Yeah. Just. I, I. I guess I am fascinated by it. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I guess is that sort of what led to the creation of uh, the junket when when you were doing that. Yeah. So the junket really came out of. Um, it was a group of of like minded friends who were. I guess we were probably in our sort of early mid twenties. None of us had quite found our feet, you know, uh, employment wise or very few of us had. And and so, mm-hmm. but we were all just sort of interested in, um, particularly influenced by the sort of psychogeography scene in, in London, in England, you know, uh, writers who, you know, they walk and they talk and they just engage with the landscape, whether it's urban or rural and, you know, just, just throwing out ideas on, on very long walks and, uh, on one of those long walks with, a, you know, most of the gang who, who went on to form the junket, we, we said, well, why don't we just put together a sort of literary magazine? Um, and this was, you know, in an era probably before podcasts, I don't know, these days we probably have just started a podcast, but, um, <laughs> and, you know, so we just said, well, let's, let's write stuff almost for each other, you know, just an essay about a thought mm. and then have each other edit it. So at least two of the other editors would edit your work. And it's a really great way, actually, to have kind of trusted friends who who can critique your your work and actually just make you better as a as a writer and a thinker. And yeah. uh, it was a really it was a really cool thing. It was it was tricky to keep going for for much longer than a few years, you know. But we um, we produced some some great pieces, and uh, you know, some of those writers that we that we championed early on have gone on to be you know published, and some of them very successful authors. And that's just a great thing. Yeah, no, I'm. Uh, that's that's amazing to hear that. That's because yeah. I, I I didn't know any of that that you know that writers would from that that you know published works in the junket you know went on to become published and and whatnot. So that's it's a great. I guess it was a great launch pad for that. And I and I'm I'm curious. You know, have you considered you know writing your own material for like films or television or, or whatnot? 
Definitely. It's something I'm, I'm getting more and more into and, and collaborating with other writers. And, and you know, because screenplay writing is a very different discipline. It's a very different business to, to writing an essay of, of thoughts or, you know, a sort of wistful poem, um, you yeah. know. And so, uh, yeah, just learning about that. And, you know, in the same way that I'm learning about filmmaking on set and, you know, hope to one day direct something, um, you know, I'm learning as I as I read more scripts and I, I perform more scripts and I meet more writers, you know, learning about the structure of a screenplay and, and actually what makes a great story for the screen as opposed to just something that I think is good, you know, actually what really right. works up there is, is uh, again, it's a weird alchemy. Yeah, well, I, I guess actually, that's actually kind of the perfect segue into The Rental because you're working with a first time, uh, you know, well, an actor turned director for the first time, yeah. uh, you know, in, in Dave Franco. And so I, I guess, did that experience um, inspire you? I guess in, in some sort of way to just, you know, kind of be on set with someone in that position, you know, who I guess has acted before and this is really their first foray. Yeah. I mean, I'm always very, very keen to champion, you know, first time directors if, if I get a good feeling off them and particularly actors turned directors. Um, you know, I obviously have a huge sympathy for, for that and, uh, you know, want to see them, want to see them succeed. Um, I also love, you know, genre movies and I think yeah. Dave was very, very smart to pick something, in that, in that world to begin with, because, you know, I think it's, it's where a lot of great filmmakers start out, whatever they go on to do later, because it has a, has quite a clear set of rules. Now, whether you follow those rules or not is up to you and, you know, but you follow some of them, you break some of them, but there's, it's, it's a, it's a recognizable field that you, you, you start out to work in. And uh, so, yeah, I thought, you know, it was, it was very playful uh, idea that he had and, and the ideas behind it were very engaging. And he was also putting together a really, a really nice team. And I thought, you know, this just sounds like a, a great, a great project to get involved in. Yeah, for sure. Well, and I, I got to start wrapping this up, but um, I, first of all, I just want to say like the rental made me never want to stay in an Airbnb ever again. That was just like, it was one of those wasn't, really unsettling. Coronavirus didn't do it, but this film. Well, <laughs> <laughs> right, of course, if it wasn't the virus, it was that. Um, but I, I guess the I, I kind of want to end on this because I know you enjoy uh, genre quite a bit um, and I, I'd be remiss if I didn't touch on Legion. So I, I'm curious, you know, when you're working on a show like that and it, it just so beautifully challenges uh, the viewer when, when you first read the script, uh, is the writing just as like mind blowing, uh, you know, as what we're seeing? Or do you think that it's a show that really um, that it's really best communicated uh, through the visual medium? I mean, it's, it's very, very visual. And obviously, when you're yeah. dealing with something as kind of uh, psychological and psychopharmaceutical and, and psychedelic as Legion, um, yeah. you know, what they do with the visuals afterwards was just so exciting to see it kind of lift off the page. That said, I mean, on the page, it's some of the finest writing I've ever come across. And Noah Hawley uh, and his whole writing team, Nathaniel Halpin as well, who's, who's gone on to do Tales from the Loop, you know, some really, really fine, fine writing on the page. And it was just an absolute joy. And... Uh, yeah, I mean, I was just, I was thrilled by what those stories became in, in the visual medium. And we had, you know, incredible uh, camera team. And um, yeah, it was a real, a real treat. And I loved, I, people's reaction to that show is, is really the best because, you know, very, very few people have seen anything like that, you know, it, it, particularly dealing with that kind of material. So it's very exciting. I mean, FX was just like completely mad to, to let that thing air on television. It's just so... I was amazed it went beyond a pilot. You know, the fact that we yeah, got right. out of yeah. that is... is uh, Three seasons. Yeah. yeah, great. So, yeah. No, we, that's yeah. that's incredible. Well, I guess uh, any future plans to sort of, uh, you know, work w with Noah Hawley? I know you were in Lucy in the Sky and whatnot, so... I hope so. Yeah, I'd love to work with with Noah again and with Nathaniel. Yeah, we you know, some some lifelong friendships there. So, yeah, we'll see what happens. For sure. Awesome. Well, Dan, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Uh, it was a pleasure talking to you about you know, you. all this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks very much.